Late Age Va Ediheim, The New Nation, Grannies and Goblins. This is a very cool nation. I think we've long needed a goblin nation in this game. One that uh, is, you know, a little, little more goblin-y than uh, Shinuyama or something like that. This nation has pretty good units and a lot of a lot of pretty good units, actually. Not a whole lot of diversity in the mages, but the mages themselves are good, and I'll talk about them in detail. Almost everything you have is stealthy. Even the, uh, the giant moose riders are stealthy. Even your sacreds are stealthy. So a really cool aspect of the nation. You can form entire armies that are stealthy in certain circumstances, like big ones. And they've got a few giants lying around, so pretty interesting. It's been a long time since I've done a national overview. I've just been so consumed in getting all of these uh, these Dominions multiplayer game episodes out almost every day. It's been pretty hard to break out of that routine, but this new nation has definitely inspired me to do so. Hopefully I can get back into squeezing in a, an overview or a similar kind of video in here and there between the multiplayer series episodes. And and I'm just going to jump right into this one, starting with discussing the units. Uh, this nation has very, very cheap massable archers. Now, unfortunately, this nation happens to be missing the three magic paths that are most important for cheap massable archers. No fire magic, no air magic, no earth magic. So no flaming arrows, no wind guide, no strength of giants, nothing like that. Uh, technically, I suppose you do have access to enlarge, which because they're size one, I mean, it'll hit a decent number of them boost their strength up a little bit. I think I think it'll make the archers do one more damage. Similarly, army of giants, but that's just a, it's just a technically thing. Yeah, the only reason I'm mentioning it, but it's still something to keep in mind that you do have spammable archers, and that does include the crossbowmen, which are also very spammable with their more accurate armor piercing, though slower crossbow bolts. One more gold, uh, more resources than these archers, but this is a very very cheap crossbow. One of the cheapest crossbows in the game, making it very unfortunate that this nation doesn't have the paths to support them very effectively. But as the game goes on, you are more likely to get a hold of those paths. And still, in the end, it's a crossbow. It pierces armor. Now, you do have a few cheap infantry options down here at seven gold each. The main differences between them are their armaments and their armor. The light variety infantry either come with a spear or an axe, where you might think about recruiting these as, you know, maybe siege chaff. At the same time, I might prefer archers if I was going that route or the uh, the crossbowmen would be pretty nice too though they cost more resources which may be very relevant depending on how you put together your scales I'll talk about that in more detail later on but if you're looking to actually recruit siege chaff you might be thinking about these seven gold units because in the end all of these units down here all these goblins they are size one that means six attacks per square now I'm not so sure about these low protection ones especially in the late ages compared to say the Vedi spearmen which is actually wearing in some some iron armor and stuff still kind of low lowish protection for the late ages, but considerably better than protection eight, and only cost twice as much resources, but still size one, six attacks per square, twice as many attacks as what a lot of nations are able to feel. Even the size two units on this nation, six attacks per square. So this attack density is a large part of what I think makes these units so, so good. I haven't really got to the good ones yet. I mean, these crossbows I think are really good. Now the Heard Vietti though, this is a bit of an awkward unit. I haven't found myself recruiting very many of these, and it's not because it's bad. I actually think this is a good unit. The problem is that it's, as far as its gold cost goes, its resource recruitment cost goes, it's kind of in the middle with this nation, making it a little bit awkward to recruit. Usually, you know, if I'm trying to spam cheap stuff, I'm going for crossbowmen or archers. And usually if I'm trying to get something a little more expensive, I'm gonna lead toward the berserkers, if not even the shinier units. So I have found myself rarely recruiting these. However, at protection 15, a little bit more hit points than a lot of the units here. Above average stats, for the most part, a more accurate attack that does a decent amount of damage compared to, you know, say, a Vetti Spearman or a Light Vetti Infantry. This thing is not bad as a frontline holder. I think one of the chief issues with it is its resource cost relative to its recruitment points. And just, it's, it's just awkward gold cost in general. Uh, it does have a bodyguard notice. So if you're having assassination problems, I think this unit's going to quickly become a, a lot more relevant to you. And I've already said it, I think this nation has really good units. I haven't even gotten to the ones that I consider are just great yet. Already, we've seen some units over here that are very capable, I think, better than what 
some other late age nations have access to in the first place due to their cost and attack density. Mm -hmm. But now look at this guy, not all that expensive, really low resource cost for, you know, decent protection and a 21 damage attack that hits harder after it goes berserk. These things can one shot a lot of stuff. Now they do have some problems. For one thing, the resource cost is kind of high and they're not holding any shields. So in your formations, you are very likely to need to employ some kind of shield wall and consider having these on the flanks. You really do want to keep arrow fire off of these things. But as long as you can, these things have a lot of killing power. I have played several blitzes now with Vettiheim and I've found that this is one of my most reliable units with this nation. So long as you've got something with shields to soak up the hits, which, you know, that is where units like this this come into play, or perhaps Vedi Spearmen. But something that I like to employ if I have built up the mass, at least for a main army, is the Rimvaedis. Now, these are capital only. They are sacred, and <laughs> they are just, they are so funny. Look at that little blue dude. This is literally just like a, a mini Nifel giant from Nifelheim, EA Nifelheim. It's got a chill aura, cold power, ice protection, a magic weapon. Like, this is actually a pretty decent sacred. Only 24 gold. The research cost is not all that high. I don't think that this is a nation where you really want to consider some super big strong bless. Like these sacreds aren't good enough for that. Like it, it comes down to their hit points. There are too many things that just kill these no matter what. And you know the fact that they are capital only. Like I don't think that this is a super bless heavy nation. Now that actually does not mean that you can't take a heavy bless on this nation. I'm going to talk about that in more detail later. And it also doesn't mean that you shouldn't take some kind of decent little bless. And I will talk about that more later too when I of pretender design. I've been tinkering around with this nation. I actually do prefer a bit of a bless and I think these units are part of that. Is because with their six attacks per square, their uh, magic weapons, their chill auras, their ice protection, cold power, I mean these units do have a lot of long-term relevance. Like they will be useful to you the entire game. If you're able to, you should have your capital pumping the maximum amount of these out that you can on as many turns as possible. They're just so cheap. Their upkeep is so low. Now, I gotta talk about the Wolf Riders. These are really, really good units in different ways. Now, this one right here, the one that has less protection, is a little cheaper. It costs 15 gold. Stats in general aren't quite as good as the Wolf Brother. This unit does serve a purpose, and that is that it can be recruited in any forest. And that includes a few other units too. The Light Vedi Infantry, both the Axe and the Spear varieties, and the Vedi Archers. All of these can be recruited in forests. What can also be recruited in all forests is a Vedi Hears Commander. Also stealthy, has the uh, the map move to take advantage of the high map move that these Wolf Riders have. And what that means is that you have cheap, decently effective against small PD raiding parties that you can get on the peripheral of your territory, as long as you have forests, and on most maps, forests are not uncommon at all. Within a couple of turns, you can pop up little raiding parties, and they can do so stealthily if you like. You know, you can move far into someone's territory. They can stealth out to avoid interception. They can pillage if you want them to. Such a good unit for raiding. But the wolf brother, the other little goblin riding a wolf, this thing I think has a different role, chiefly due to its higher protection, and that is is in the flanks of your armies on attack rear commands as well as you can just use these to friggin expand. These are really good at expansion and you do have some other options for expansion. Uh, Rim Vietes with Vedi Berserkers are pretty good at expansion. Uh, <laughs> Heard Vietes actually aren't too shabby, depending on what you're going up against. It all comes down to that attack density. You know, you do have a, actually a lot of options for expansion with this nation, but I do think the Wolf Brothers are a really good option for that because of their high mat movement. They can often get across to provinces faster than, you know, a lot of these goblins can on their teensy weensy little legs. Look at that, mat move eight, mat move 10. But these wolves are quick. And these Wolf Brothers with their high defense skills these things can go up against smaller amounts of barbarians and smaller amounts of heavy cav without casualties. Now they still are going to struggle against you know huge huge piles of heavy cav like you know a lot of things do but you do have another option for that up in your commanders when it comes to expansion. Something else kind of cool about these units is if they if this rider gets killed the wolf will stick around in the battle until either the wolf gets killed or the battle ends then I guess it runs off because you don't get to keep the wolf but that does give these units a little bit of extra added value. Now do pay attention to the recruitment points here. I can tell you already, uh, m you should probably take order three on this nation. I mess around with a lot of builds and for not just for this, but for a, you know, a lot of things going on here, order three is definitely something you should be strongly considering. You might also be considering sloth on this nation. A lot
lot of your good stuff does not require a whole lot of resources, which there is some stuff that is a little more hilly in the resource side of things as opposed to the recruitment. So that is something to consider if you're thinking about lots of crossbows, obviously don't go sloth, but even with this cost, you still be able to get, get away with quite a few of them. Now here is something goofy. One of the more unusual units in the game, in my opinion. Two goblins sitting on a gigantic moose, or you know, maybe that's a normal sized moose. Moose are actually really big, and goblins are pretty small. One of these goblins has a short bow, the other one has a crossbow. That means in one turn, it's shooting both a crossbow bolt and a short bow arrow. Then the turn after, an arrow, then a crossbow bolt and an arrow, so on and so forth. So a forearm, eight-legged unit that in melee range actually does a decent amount of damage, not too accurately. Now, funnily enough, uh, <laughs> it is stealthy, which, you know, I guess in the end it is a moose. Moose don't exactly crash through the forests. It's just so big that it's kind of funny to think of it as being stealthy. And if this thing dies, it drops the crossbowman. So you effectively get one of these when it dies, and it's permanent. You get to keep it too, unlike the wolf from the Wolf Brothers or the Wolf Riders. This thing sticks around after the battle. Now, there's something kind of funny about this, and that's that these moose riders <laughs> cost six resources, and these crossbowmen cost eight resources. So there's some kind of weird alchemical something going on when this moose dies that m manages to uh, to get better armor onto the goblin that it's dropping. And you can even see that the armor is different when you compare the two. Uh, I think this might have been an oversight by the developers, actually, that this cost six resources. Unfortunately, it'd be a little bit resource expensive if they actually went with, uh, let's see, it would be 11, then maybe 12 because it's an animal. Yeah, that's actually, no, that's fine. That's reasonable. 12 resources. It's probably what it should be. Not really for balancing reasons, more for flavor reasons. Like from a balance perspective, like, I mean, this, I I don't recruit a lot of these. Now, that's not to say that they're bad. Uh, I actually think that later on in the game, maybe around the mid game, depending on what you've got going on and what you're up against, maybe buffing these wouldn't be too bad because they'd kind of be not, you know, I'd really have to see it to believe it. Just the low attack and defense skill and the low protection, low morale, really low MR. Like, I want to believe that these can act as archers that when you get into melee range of them, do a lot of damage. Uh, you would need some uh, some pretty good buffs for that, and by that time, you know, your opponent is also very likely to have buffs online. It's like, you could instead recruit three and a half of these or four of these, or you just or just like, you know, a Hirdvedi and, and a couple of crossbowmen or archers. I just, I really want to believe it. If anyone has any ideas about this unit, I'd really like to hear them. And then, pretty cool, uh, Vediheim does have access to a couple of Jotun units, only on the capital. Now, unfortunately, with the Axemen, it is so resource heavy that I don't really see it as feasible to recruit. And you know, it's also just, it's not that good. Especially when you consider you've got these things running around that hit almost as hard as it does. Keep in mind they go berserk too. You know, these hit more accurately than these do, and with much greater attack density. Like, these are size 4. Of course, you'll probably have a couple goblins at their feet, so it'll be about 3 attacks per square a lot of the time. But all in all, I don't really see any reason to recruit these. Unless maybe you really need some big hits, or maybe some hit points with some weird shenanigans that you've got going on. Maybe some soul vortex regeneration, communion, goofy stuff. I don't know. Seems like a lot of work, and there are probably better alternatives once you get to that stage in the game. Uh, these Jotun Hurlers, though, I actually think are pretty good for sieging. Part of that is that they don't cost a whole lot of resources, so even if you take some sloth, you can actually mass a decent amount of these. And then this here is by far the most most gold efficient seed strength that you're going to get. You can spend twice as much gold as this on goblins, and you still aren't going to get up to 9.4 seed strength. On top of that, their you know their protection is not terrible. I mean, it is it is kind of bad for the late ages, but this is already what you're dealing with with a lot of your goblins. So it's already something that you have to you know work about fixing up with buffs and stuff. And you have the paths for that. This thing still has the hard hitting attack at the same accuracy that the Yon Axeman has. It doesn't hit quite as hard, but that, you know, it's not a huge difference. And then has a couple of huge ass freaking boulders that do 36 damage. Uh, unfortunately, it only has two of them and the range is really low. But this is funny, like this amount of damage right here is enough to erase a few things that are a little bit difficult to answer otherwise. Now, usually when I'm employing these, I try to keep them like out of harm's way, say in the back of my formation, which then kind of, you know, they can help with uh, attack rear commands back there. But because they're capital only, I generally don't want to lose them. You know, I want to use them for sieging quickly, which this nation is very capable of doing because of this unit. So I think a very important unit when you're considering sieging people down like this, you should be able to 
to break a fort, if not immediately in just a couple of turns, no matter what. And those are kind of my thoughts on these units. I think the ones to pay attention to the most are the archers, the crossbowmen, the Yvette Berserkers, Wolf Brothers, the uh, the Sacreds, of course, and the Jotun Hurlers. Now as for commanders, I think all of these are useful. It's pretty rare that I look at a nation and want to use every single one of its commanders that it has. Now this nation does have a significant weakness in leadership. This is it. This is your best leader. No formations for you. This is huge. And honestly, I think a good balancing feature for this nation because otherwise all of these high density units in lines, oh man, that would be a nightmare to deal with. So if you want better than 60 leadership, you're going to have to get creative. That being said, that makes this your best leader and is why these are very relevant to you. Just like almost everything else you have, it is stealthy and actually not very expensive at only 50 gold. And the other pure leader that you have is the Vetti Hearse. This one is really nice because you can recruit it in any forest and has really good map move, which is very relevant to your wolf riders. These are generally what you want to be using to build your fortresses. You can use them as scouts if you haven't found a cheaper scout province. And they are very good at leading raid parties of either wolf riders or wolf brothers. Now only 40 leadership, this is the theme of your nation, you do not have good leaders, but they get the job done. And before I talk about the mages, I'm going to talk about the Dimvaetes. These are your assassins. Now in some regards, these are very good. In others, they are very bad. The main thing that makes them bad is that they are capital only. And you have something that is very much competing for your capital only recruitment, which is your most powerful mage. So unfortunately, you're not going to probably be seeing a lot of these. However, where these are really important is in expansion. You can significantly cut down on the losses to your expansion part. You know, I really wanna open my window and tell this guy that his motorcycle just doesn't work. You hear that? It just doesn't work, dude. That's like the uh, 30 or 40th time I, that he's tried to start it. It's been kind of, it's been interrupting my commentary. But yeah, it's a gold cost is kind of up there for an assassin. Its protection is kind of low for an assassin. What it does have, and what I think makes it kind of cool, are its daggers. One dagger is a poison damage. It does a pretty solid amount of poison damage. And the other one causes bleeding. Both of these have pretty good attack values. So when this thing does get into melee range, it's pretty likely to hit. Now, when you're done, expanding, you are likely to have quite a few of these left over, or at least a few. Uh, don't be wasteful with them because this uh, this Dust Dagger Poison Dagger combo thing right here actually makes it so that when they do get into melee range, if you set them up properly, they are even if they die, they are likely to kill whatever they're assassinating, either through bleeding or poison or both. Uh, you are a blood nation. Think about Rings of the Warrior for these. is going to boost their attack skill by five and make it even more likely to get poison or bleeding onto somebody. And that is such a cheap magic item at only only five blood slaves. It really is unfortunate that this is capital only. At the same time, you know, I get it. I actually think as far as late ages go that this nation is actually very strong in its current state. So it doesn't need recruit everywhere assassins. That would just, that would just make it gross. So for now, at least in my opinion, these mainly only have relevance in your expansion phase, which in which they are very relevant. This is what I send to big cavalry and big barbarian provinces. And now I'm going to talk about the mages. The Vedi Goad is pretty interesting. Leaders 40 and is a priest, so this is what you will be using to lead expansion parties that have Rimviety in them if you are using these in your expansion parties, and also is a nature one mage, so has some utility in that regard. To a minor extent, you can use these to buff your own units. You can also use them to cast Swarm. Both of those things have relevance if you're using these to lead raiding parties. It's going to make, you know, if you have uh, if you have Vetti Goads leading around some Wolf Brothers, either buffing the Wolf Brothers or casting Swarm and things like that, you're going to have some, uh, some pretty nasty raiding parties. What these also do is they summon allies in the form of they get two wolves a turn if you choose to do this. Now I uh, in almost all situations I don't think this is worth it because they could be researching. Uh, I do think that this is a nation where you really want to strongly consider magic scales too and I'll talk about that more when I get to another mage. So if these things are researching at 10 research like is that really worth two wolves? In most situations I don't think so. Now if you're somewhere where it can't research but it's got to wait for a minute yeah maybe summon some wolves it at least has that little bit of extra utility though you know you also got a site search I, I think site searching is more important if you haven't site searched a place for nature yet even in some instances preaching <laughs> you know so it's like the wolf stuff doesn't come up that much I don't think unless you know you just really like dogs I really wish it didn't have the uh, the sacred wolf what are those called again it's got a picture of a, of a Jotun wolf here it's a, it's a little bit misleading it's almost like there's there's some way to get Jotun wolves with them I don't think there is maybe I'm, I'm missing something drastic if you get Jotun wolves with these you did 
actually be super dope, but I, I don't see anything but the uh, the two wolves. It's just too inefficient with research turns to use, in my opinion. And a lot of times it's like, I'm not even using these to research anyway. I'm using these to, uh, to lead little armies. Now this mage right here is my favorite part of the nation. Looking at it at first, you might be thinking, oh, well, you know, it's randoms aren't very consistent. It's kind of expensive. Oh, whoa, look at that upkeep. Seven hit points? I mean, come on. Uh, it shrinks people with its slap. That's kind of funny. But what I really like about this mage is the changes that they made to Twice Born in this in the same patch that Vedheim came out in. Twice Born only costs five death gems for size one units. These Vedigijas are very, very inexpensive to cast Twice Born on. Now, what they also have is all of them have death, all of them have nature. All of them can cast Twice Born, though you may need to pass a staff to a lot of them. All of them can cast Transformation. Now, it may seem like a little bit of a non bow to cast Twice Born and Transformation on the same unit, but there's been more than one change to Twice Born, and I'm actually going to spend a portion of this video talking about this unit and what this means for it, what, what these two paths mean, and why this why I love this unit so much. I'm not saying that this is necessarily like super strong. It actually might be. I don't know enough yet about how this is going to like perform in, in the long term as far as this nation goes. I haven't had enough chance to flesh it out. Uh, nature gems and death gems are both very, very important to this nation. There's a lot of competition to use them, but you'll see later what I'm talking about. Uh, there's going to be a, an entire section in this video where I talk about using twice born and transformation on these mages. Now, when it comes to these mages just as they are, I think it's pretty important to have at least a couple of forts pumping these out because most of these randoms are in fact very useful. Uh, your least useful one is probably the water random, but you do need, you know, you do need someone to research and it's not like they're completely useless, you know, I mean, I guess you could contact naiads with the water randoms, but you probably won't need to do that more than once or twice. And 20% of them are going to be water too. Pretty efficient uh, frozen heart spammers, I suppose. Though the water too necessarily is not that bad depending on uh, what happens if you're going down the twice born transformation route. I'll talk about that later. Now as for these other randoms, all of them are fairly good. The astral and blood randoms can enter communions. The blood randoms might also have some cross paths that you may use for some rituals. And then the death and nature randoms give you either death to or nature to. Both very good. Definitely the most important mages I think that you can get out of these. Not that the, uh, the astral randoms are bad though. Like I think in general you probably want these to be uh, a lot of the times communion masters and maybe use something with a, a little more HP as communion slaves but it does kind of depend on what you're casting and what's going on. Death 2s are of course capable of spamming Horde of Skeletons as well as using an assortment of handy death spells and the nature items are fairly capable of applying buffs to your units. Now as this unit stands by itself it is expensive. Uh, 7 hit points is really bad. This thing is really vulnerable to like rituals that do damage like remotely seeking arrow <laughs> Oof. Uh, seeking arrow is something that is very 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 dangerous to you if you're making use of a lot of these and you're not twice sporting them you should twice sporting these it only costs five death gems to twice born these you don't necessarily need to twice born every single one but if you're using them in armies you probably should there's a very good chance you're gonna die even just like stuff that does battlefield wide damage very dangerous to these units and there's other incentives to twice born you know especially the uh, the death randoms the death twos. Twice Borning has a pretty good ratio of increasing in death when you use it. It's something like 20 to 25%. So not only are you getting a more powerful chassis, a more useful chassis, a chassis with cold aura, which, you know, you should almost certainly play this nation in uh, in Cold Dominion. You absolutely should play this nation in Cold Dominion. White mages are really cool, and I think this is one of the best units to twice born in the game because it is a decent mage with decent path diversity that only now costs five death gems to use twice born on, and that is in opposition to something like this. This at size four costs 20 death gems to twice born. Twice born is really quickly becoming a very expensive thing for large units. Now, there's a reason for this. Bigger units now twice born into better things. You twice born one of these and you get a little size one white hag. Well, without, you know, transforming it first, wink, wink. And you still get a better unit. It's going to have 15 hit points. Won't just immediately die to seeking arrow. Uh, this actually has a special twice born chassis. 
fancy, but do keep in mind you are paying a pretty penny for that. Now that aside, uh, this is, I mean, this is a really important mage. This is how you get your death three, your nature three, your, wait, why am I even talking about, I, I built a chart for this. Yeah, excuse a couple of my color choices on this. I'm sure that's beautiful on your eyes right there, but that's fine. That's what commentary is for. Now there are 15 varieties of these. All of them are good. And for most of these, you're going to want, you know, at least one of them as the game goes on. That's why you should recruit so many of these. Even though they're really expensive, they are capital only and you only get so many. Unfortunately, they're not slow to recruit and you shouldn't have too much competition for upkeep from other mages. As if you need to, you can twice spawn a lot of your little dudes. Now it is really hard to recruit a bad mage when recruiting these Jotun Gigas. I think the worst thing you could land is a water two similar to the little Gigas. In fact, if you're doing water rituals and construction, you should probably use the little Gigas because you know, you are going to get water two ones and they are, uh, they're not as good as researchers as the Yon Gigas are. So this is kind of the bummer thing to land, but everything else is definitely indisputably good. Death 2s make skeletons and nature 2s very effectively support armies. You of course definitely want at least one death 3 and nature 3 for path climbing. A death 3 one is one that you very well may consider twice forming for the potential to climb up into death 4. Though at this point, you know, I would say that a lot of times with like size 2 mages, I think it, it still is a good wager to twice born instead of empowerment when climbing death. These not as much. However, the death 3 randoms aren't too common. So it's one of those things that you can consider. Uh, the nature blood rituals, you do, I mean, you could of course use this on the battlefield for its end too, but there's some stuff going on with the blood nature cross path. Uh, Crossbreeding comes to mind. Uh, blood fecundity, which is a way to increase growth on provinces. This is a nation that does have access to blood fecundity. So if you want to make extensive use of it, you could potentially take a little bit lower growth scales and just boost them up artificially with this spell. Depending on how your pretender is set up, I think this random right here, the, uh, the blood two with the water random is a very important random because this right here is your base into casting ill winter into summoning ice devils into summoning nifal yarls if you decide to this is the easiest way you're going to climb up into that stuff that is presuming you don't get a pretty good 10 percent random that makes it even easier a uh, blood three water random would be dope but i wouldn't i wouldn't hold your breath which honestly this might seem like it's really hard to get up into casting something like ill winter which is blood five water three uh it's it's, it's not that hard. Blood is blood is fairly easy to empower. You do have access to some boosters in it. So, well, some of them fairly early on, even at construction two. But the water rams, at least with this random right here, you will need construction six for. So it could be a bit of a hurdle. Something I will say about this random over here is that depending on your construction situation, this might make your blood six rituals a little bit more accessible because you only need construction four to get water three. Whereas you can, you, you can just empower blood if you need to. Blood saves can be pretty easy to get. And with this nation, you have a really good blood hunter, which I will get to soon. When you have construction six, this is definitely the easier way to get up into your higher water blood rituals. And then you've got this wonky random right here. You can cast foul vapors with this. So it does have a use there. It is pretty easy for you to cast poison ward with this nation. And then you've got the big blood down here, which you know, also this is worthy of note too for, you know, death blood rituals in the long run. Lots of really good randoms, both on the battlefield and out of the battlefield. Really important mage because these randoms are so diverse and some of them are like you need for very specific things. Definitely recruit as much of these as you can and 10% of them are even better. Something else that is pretty cool about these is that they do have 40 leadership. This really helps since you don't have very good leaders. If you have like, you know, big death balls with quite a few of these in it, you can sort of make pseudo line formations with lots of boxes of goblins. Now there can be some route issues associated with that as opposed to, you know, big lines of over 100 units, but that's better than these having 10 leadership, you know? The old age does kind of suck, but at least these ones are sacred. If you really wanted to, you could overcome this with an aging. And then we get to this little unit right here, the Ba'edi Hag. This is a very important unit. The reason being that it only costs 40 gold and it can be recruited in all forests. Now, something about forests with this nation. Labs only cost 250 gold 
in forests. So what you should be doing is pushing around one of these goads right here into every single forest you own and building a lab and recruiting these in that forest for most of the rest of the game in every single forest that you have. For two reasons. One, research. This nation has a really good research ramp because of these, especially if you take M3 scales. And this is a very, very good reason to take M3 scales. These are research at eight. You don't have air magic. You can't make owl quills easily. You don't have fire magic. You can't make lanterns easily. You do have death magic, but you, you don't want to use your death gems on school mentors, especially because you have these. These can take the place of your research items in getting ramp. They're very good for that. Now, of course, they do have upkeep, so that is something you need to consider in the long run. What these things also are is, you know, they are stealthy, like a lot of your other things, and all of these paths right here, of course, they only get one in each of these paths. These are like all of the best paths to have only one magic in. Air, fire, and earth is not too exciting to have one path in. Uh, death isn't enormously exciting, but yet you can at least cast reanimation with death one mages. The rest of these actually have things, you know, they can do. Water randoms, frozen heart. That's that's more than nothing. Astro randoms, they can enter communions. They can form their own little communions of a bunch of little astro one mages and could potentially do some damage there. They could, they could magic duel. This is a really cheap magic duel unit. If your opponent has, say, astral, low astral on their pretender, or if they're using lots of like expensive slow to recruit, recruit like astral three, astral four mages, things like that. Punish them with a bunch of these little astral one Vetti hags. Have these follow around your, if someone's using mind hunt, have some little astral random Vetti hags following around your armies to keep them off of them. Though you probably have astral mages around anyway. Nature randoms, these can cast swarm. A couple of these, just a couple of them. At only 40 gold, stealthy, can raid province defense with swarm. And then you have your all important blood hunters. This right here is your blood hunter. Hand them a dousing rod and put them to work. A lot of things make this mage really good. The biggest thing I think is that you don't need a fort to recruit these. You don't need a temple. All you need is a 250 gold lab. And if, as long as you've got like five or six forests, you're gonna watch your research spike like crazy. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the national spells that this nation has. It does have some really cool ones. I think some of the cooler national spells in this game. And these two are something to consider when it comes to your bless. And these are also competition for your nature and death gems. Now Glossos, which you get 9 of at 13 death gems a pop, only requires a death 2 mage to cast pretty easy. Conjuration 3 comes really early, which is where I think these spells are more relevant is in early wars especially in a war that you did not want to start. Like these could be very helpful defensively, but also offensively. Like that's that's where I see these. This is, this is early war stuff or mid game throne rush stuff, depending on what kind of wacky stuff you're doing. These Glossos have a pretty powerful poison damage attack. They're size three tramplers, so they'll trample anything size two or lower and are stealthy. So you can stealth them around with your goblin armies if you want to. The dark vision, fire resistance and heat aura are just kind of a bonus. And the Yotan Wolves, which come at two nature gems a pop, five at a time, are pretty powerful units. Uh, unfortunately, they are size four, so you're only getting these two attacks per square, and it's not it, too likely due to their combat speed, which is really high, that you're going to be getting the, uh, the little goblins around their feet. But still, at 23 strength, these attacks hit pretty hard. They've got a good amount of hit points. Uh, once again, this is a hit point amount where if you did take one HP in your bless, say in either nature or blood, this would put them into a new regeneration threshold. And and you do have the paths for casting regeneration on your units. Uh, the cold resistance does fit into a, a lot of the stuff that you do and are capable of. They go berserk, which helps them, you know, stay on the field, not route. They do more damage and they have a fear bonus. So they can assist in causing enemies to route, especially in decently large numbers. Very solid sacred unit. The problem with these is how important your nature and death gems are. And not just for like the gimmicky freaking twice born transformation stuff I've been talking about. There is so much that you want to do with your death and nature gems. It is where pretty much all of your most accessible and your best summons are. There'll be times where you're wanting to use these just straight up on the battlefield for spells. Lots of construction items you want to be using, these, especially if you start dipping into thugs, which this nation is very capable of doing. And these are with the paths on your mages where a lot of your thug equipment, your good thug equipment, you know, like vine shields, now on certain chassis you may even consider horror helmets, boots of the messenger. There, there's a lot of competition for these 
these gems. Uh, Lamia queens and Lamias if you're doing some weird lopsided communion stuff or Sabbath at that point. But still, if you're getting pressured in an early war or if you're planning to do some serious damage in the early mid game, uh, keep these spells in mind, especially if you have a halfway decent bless. Uh, Seath Curse, uh, I can't actually ever say that I've used this spell. It seems that it curses commanders for three death gems. This doesn't look worth it to me. Maybe I'm naive about something, especially considering the fact that it looks like you're getting something cursed yourself when you use it. Like this seems really expensive for what it does. Even just the mage turn. I don't even know if I'd want to use a mage turn and get what, does this mean that one of my commanders will get cursed? I don't know if I really would want to do that. Death gems aside, maybe someone knows better than me and can say something about it. But yeah, th this just kind of looks bad to me, which yeah, I've never used it. Uh, this spell I have used before though, Great Bear. That being said, I don't think it's a very good spell, especially, you know, when at one more level of conjuration, you've got Jotun Wolves with nature gems. Very much better use of your nature gems, in my opinion. There's a lot of better use for your nature gems, in my opinion, than this. I guess this is a pretty desperate move right here if you're casting Sloth of Bears. These aren't the uh, the fancy Rusty and Sacred Bears. They're just bears. Literally just, like, you go out in the woods, there's a bear. That's what this is. I just wish these had a bite attack as well. I, I kind of, I think it's kind of silly that they don't. Th these things should bite, too. I'd like them a little bit more if they had two attacks. And now we get into some of the juicier spells. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with Illwinter. This is a global that actually does not require that many blood slaves. This is this is a pretty easy amount of blood slaves to get a hold of. However, uh, people are going to want to dispel this. Uh, blood globals now, if uh, someone wants to dispel them, the extra blood slaves that you put into it only count as like say half a gem, half a pearl, so to speak. So if you overcast it for, you know, say like 60 blood slaves, that is equal to like a 30 pearl overcast on a dispel. And people will probably want to dispel this if it goes up. This is this is a really annoying spell. Uh, really good for you though. One of those things that if you have the blood economy going for it, if you have the mage that can cast it or can easily make the mage that can cast it, is like, go ahead and do it. The world is going to get progressively colder, which is really good for all of your units and really bad for most other units that are going to be in the game. Causes a lot of unrest, so negatively impacts people's income. There's also going to be stuff like Nephil Giants and Nephil Shamans and like wolves and Jotun wolves and dire wolves and stuff attacking people's provinces at random. And some of that stuff is really powerful with its cold power and its chill auras and stuff like that. So it can be a huge hassle for your opponents. Uh, you aren't going to get the Nephil Giant recruitment, unfortunately, because you aren't a Jotun nation, quote unquote, even though you have a few Jotuns, you're a goblin nation. But unfortunately, that makes you out of the four nations that can cast this the, uh, the least powerful for you. However, still a very powerful spell for you uh, because you prefer Cold 2 Dominion, it's going to affect your income a lot less than it's going to affect people who are in like, who prefer Hot Dominion or Neutral. Now, other players are probably not going to appreciate you casting this spell. That is something to keep in mind when you're casting it. Like, can you deal with all of your neighbors attacking you after casting this spell? I was kind of mentioning, like, you know, just rushing this. It'd be such a funny thing to rush Blood 6 and cast Old Winter as soon as possible. But people aren't going to like you for it. It's probably going to get dispelled and there's a very good chance you'll get attacked. So this is something you should think about when you are trying to bring the game to a close in your favor. Now, as L.A. Vedeheim, you have an added incentive to cast this spell, and that is Winter's Call. If you have Ill Winter active, you can summon Nephil Jarls at 86 blood gems a pop. These things are straight up super competence in Cold Dominion between their cold power, their very powerful cold auras, ice protection, pairs very well with Ill Winter. These are the things that EA Nifelheim can just recruit off of their capital. Uh, these are what they can random. They can get death three and water four, water four not being enormously exciting. But hey, would be your uh, your biggest water if you get a hold of it. Uh, the air randoms are very, very good. While holding a gem, they can cast mist form, they can cast flight on themselves. These are very, very powerful commanders. You do have to gear them though. You're gonna need to be suiting these in armor on their heads and their bodies. You know, give them frost brands, something like that. Uh, vine shields are of course really nice if you can afford them. Boots of the messenger. Sometimes I'll give the, uh, <laughs> if I've got some air gems flying, floating around and an air mage on it. Yeah, when I'm playing EA and Nephilim, this is where I have most of my experience with these. I'll give the the non-air random some flying boots just to make them annoying. A little bit pricey. In general, you know, you are going to be investing quite a bit of gems into these past the uh, the 86 blood slaves. What's also really annoying about these is that these have upkeep. About 200 gold upkeep a year. Even if you summon them like this, these have upkeep. So a little bit obnoxious. Uh, are these worth summoning? Uh, yeah, I actually
actually do think so. If you have the blood economy to produce this kind of stuff, I mean, go for it. Uh, these are really good leaders, which is something that, you know, you kind of you desperately need. But yeah, definitely get those little 40 gold blood random hags blood hunting as soon as possible because this is a pretty cool national spell for you. Now, one that I don't think is quite quite as relevant, mainly due to the requirements of cast that you pretty much got to do this with a pretender, is the Dwarf of the Four Directions spell, coming in really late in the game at Conjuration 8. Now as far as path diversity goes, I mean these mages are great. These have everything that you don't have, and they have Master Smith as well. Really powerful air mages, all capable of easily casting Storm or Fog Warriors, and this is interesting if you manage to summon all four of these dwarves, or if they just all four of them get summoned by various players, I'm not sure which other nations have access to this, this is a new spell. Uh, they are unique, so you only get one of each. Perpetual darkness, perpetual storm over the entire world. So projectiles are going to get wrecked. Flying, for the most part, is going to get wrecked. People who can't see in the dark are going to get wrecked. There's also going to be a lot of hurricanes, though that happens the more dwarves you summon, not just if all of them are missing. So kind of an interesting and flavorful spell. Really hard for you to cast, though I th these are a couple of paths I do recommend on your pretender regardless. Not just for path-fixing reasons, but also for, you know, the bless. Shock resistance and reinvigoration I think are pretty strong picks for this nation. So pretty cool and flavorful spell. Like it'd be, it'd be a really funny thing to try and get away with. If you really if you really were trying to get away with you might want to uh, think about spirit. Well and actually no, I guess spirit so wouldn't be that important. Probably really just isn't something you should cast but you could prepare for it. Yeah you know with a with a spirit side bless and maybe just build up a lot of undead which you know you should probably do anyway as this nation. But I think overall this is I mean this is this is pretty powerful depending on the nation you are. It's more so that it's just not enormously because you don't you don't have like a bunch of dark vision units like some other nations do it's not like theft of the sun with shababa or anything like that where it's like a very uh very powerful and sensible spell necessarily so it could be really game changing but i think more so when it comes to Vettiheim, it's like an oh ha, ha, he actually cast that kind of thing or if you managed to get away with this it'd be a, a pretty funny gimmick um one thing kind of interesting thing about this is uh this isn't a global so to speak at least i don't think it is i actually haven't ca I, haven't, I haven't done this myself i haven't tested this this doesn't, it doesn't look like a global to me. So I'm pretty sure that means that this can be dispelled in the way that globals typically can be dispelled. You literally have to kill a dwarf and return him to his atlas-like task to dispel this sort of global. So kind of interesting. Now I'm going to spend some time talking about pretender design. We got a lot of new pretender chassis in the last patch. But Heim has access to a couple of these new chassis. Or actually I suppose technically I'm not entirely sure if these are new or if the artwork is just new. The bog mummy is kind of expensive for what it is. It doesn't get a whole lot of path diversity, but it's immortal. So if you want to go for a flavor pick, I think this one is definitely flavorful, and you could do some you could do some interesting SC stuff with it, depending on how you set it up, as you don't have to worry about tediously reviving it with priests every time it dies. And the Scrotty, I actually doubt that this is new. I think it might just be new artwork, but I don't think this is a very good start for a Rainbow Mage compared to some of the other options you have. Like if you wanted blood on your Rainbow Mage, you could get one with better abilities for cheaper. Now, as for what I've been preferring for this nation. I've been leaning toward the immobiles as well as the rainbow pretenders, as this nation does not really have any need for an awake expander. This nation expands just fine, and I'll be demonstrating that later on in the video. I would never fault anyone for taking something like a son of Nephil, but I don't think it's very efficient when it comes to design points. Uh, the demi lich is sort of a hybrid between an immobile and a rainbow, and something that is definitely a good pick, depending on what you're doing. I'll kind of just, I'll show you a few things I've been messing with here. So first I'm going to talk about the scales down here, uh, I think Order 3 is really strong on this nation. If you look at kind of what I've been considering to be your best units, like the Vedi Berserker, the Wolf Brother, ooh, uh, the Rim Vietti, these all have a lot of recruitment points relative to their resources. Even these Jotun Hurlers are more recruitment intensive than resource intensive. So Order 3, depending on how you're recruiting, is very likely to determine your cap on recruitment as opposed to resources, which by the way, I personally do prefer Sloth on this nation. And you could definitely play this nation with production. The Vedi Crossbowman is a good example of why, but even the Heard Vedi is a little bit resource intensive compared to its recruitment and is not a bad unit. Like I personally don't find myself recruiting them a whole lot, but they're not bad. The uh, the Vedi Spearman is another example. And I mean, if you really like these Jotun Axemen, I, I don't think these are honestly really worth it at all. But if you like these, you know, I, I can't fault someone for recruiting things that they like. Uh, you'll definitely want resources if you're thinking about those. But I think, you know, I think you're using a lot of design points on just like one or two units that you don't need to either recruit in the first place or 
recruit as many of as quickly. I think the crossbowmen are something that you, you'll be able to get plenty of them if you need them anyway at Sloth 2. And by the way, this right here, I've done, I've done some tinkering around with the scales. I think Sloth 2 is a really good sweet spot for Order 3. With Sloth 3, sometimes I find out I have some recruitment left over when I run out of resources. With Sloth 1, I usually find I have resources left over when I'm out of recruitment. This is like, this is a nice little sweet spot that I've kind of found right here. Just personally for the, for the things that I like to recruit. Uh, Cold 3 is something that I think is really hard to not take on this nation. Your Sacreds, which I do think you should get a decent number of, have Cold Power, they have Ice Protection, they have a Chill Aura. Nearly all of your units have Cold Protection of at least 5, so you are more in your element in the cold. Like, you can, you know, you could get away with things like Grip of Winter more easily than other nations. Uh, the one unit you do have that is not cold resistant is the moose, which I think is kind of silly. Moose have no problem hanging out in snow, and they finally have to do have snow move. And snow move is, is another good point as to why cold three is something you can utilize. Like, it's going to be harder for your opponents to move around than it is for you to move around in the snow. Uh, though a lot of your little goblins don't have snow move, they just have tiny little legs and they've still got to shuffle through it at a slow pace. If you do start using twice born, say on your Vedi Gigas, where it's cheap, and start getting hold of whites, Whites also have cold auras, so that's something to keep in mind. And if you really are thinking about Nifo Jarls with Ill Winter and stuff like that, Nifo Jarls are a lot more powerful in Cold Dominion. Now, growth is something that, I mean, in general, this is the best income scale, and you do need a lot of income on this nation. Your mages are expensive, so gold is really important to you, and that makes growth really important to you. Now, you could, if you are really into micromanaging with rituals, you could go with growth one and use blood fecundity but you have to prepare for that and it's not something that I recommend doing without practice because it really is a lot of work to keep all of your important provinces up on their growth scales. Now luck is in kind of an interesting spot with this nation. I have been talking about some shenanigans that involve transformation and that might make it seem like oh well um well luck is a good a good thing to take if you're playing with transformation. Now I'm not gonna say that that isn't true. You absolutely can take luck on this nation because your units are are super great, your mages are good, and you don't need a strong bless. And you know, because you can already very comfortably dump your resources, you could potentially put those scales elsewhere. Like luck isn't just for, you know, some weird transformation shenanigan that you might be thinking about doing. Luck paired with other positive scales, I think is a very good scale for infrastructure, it is often a good scale for magic diversity. You do generally see a lot of wizards just kind of pop up and join you. That is if you also take the M3 scale, which I'll talk about in a bit. You get a lot of gem income events. You get a lot of gold income events. Like luck all around. If you can afford it, a lot of nations can't afford to take this. It is a good scale. It can definitely be the difference between you winning and losing a game. Now, I've talked about the scale a little bit in the context of transformation, which even if you aren't doing weird shenanigans, can be really useful on your Jotun Gijas because they have high upkeep and all of them can cast transformation. And these ones, you probably don't want to twice born first because of how expensive you are. And then the luck scales are going to significantly influence how many of them survive transformation or don't turn into foul spawn. But if you're twice burning a lot of these at only five death gems and then transforming them, if they die in transformation, it doesn't matter. They're twice born. They just pop up as little white mages. So if that's your shtick, if that's your deal, you can easily tank luck. You don't care at all about luck in the context of transformation, though I do believe after a decent amount of testing that your luck scales will influence your transformation results, and you, I do think you are more likely to get large results at luck three, and more likely to get occasional things like insects at, at misfortune. So that is something to consider. However, if you tank misfortune, more things are open to you. For example, you could take a dormant pretender that has the paths that you don't have. So this is a really good path fixing option. Get this site searching and you're very likely to break into some of these paths a little bit. And with fire and earth, it's not that difficult to summon mages that are decently high up in these paths. Air, it's a, it's a little bit challenging though. Though you do have some national summons with some air capabilities, if only minor ones. And this one would be able to forge boosters for them if you really wanted to though. Air boosters are expensive. Air in general is, is hard to is hard to boost, it's hard to summon in general. It's, yeah, it's a difficult path. But this is a really comfortable option. I have 
have played or played with this before, and I've had a decent amount of success with this as well in blitzes that I've played. Now, when it comes to picking a bless for this nation, something you do have to consider is that you're not just picking a bless for the Rimbaetes. You do have some sacred summons that may become relevant uh, earlier on in the game, but I think as the game goes on, uh, you, you really got to consider what you're doing with your Death and Nature gems. But if you are doing any shenanigans with Fady Gigjas and Twice Born and Transformation, those are going to be sacred, and a lot of them are going to be Thug Chassis. So that is also something to consider. Both of your best mages are sacred, and if you ever do get into Nifal Jarls, those are also sacred and can bless themselves. So taking a Fat Bless is something you should, I think you should definitely consider, so long as you can keep some of the basics of your scales up. I think Order 3 is pretty important. I think Magic 3 is very important. Oh, which I forgot to mention real quick. It's because of these. These go from 5 research to 8 research at Magic 3. And since they're so easy to spam with these cheap labs and forests, no infrastructure required other than that, uh, yeah, I think Magic 3 scales are extremely important on this nation. This is going to give you an enormous spike in research. Uh, you could potentially go down to Growth 1 for the reasons that I discussed, but in general, these are, I think, the things that you have to consider the most when you're looking at your scales. I think the Magic 3 is probably the most important out of them. And past that, you can wiggle around with your Bless. Now, getting a dormant Path Fixer is something that I think is really nice, but you really do have a lot of options with this nation. For example, you could go Imprisoned, and suddenly you can start looking at a kind of a, a decent looking Rainbow Bless here. And when it comes to choosing individual Blesses in these categories, I'll mostly be looking at non-incarnate Blesses, though there are a few incarnate ones that I will mention briefly. Uh, major Fire Resistance is something that, you know, if you don't take, and this, this applies for most nations, you are risking being countered by Fire Elementals. Now, depending on the nations you're playing with, that's not always a significant threat, and sometimes attack skill is pretty nice. I mentioned this elsewhere. I do think it is usually a mistake to not take Major Shock Resistance. If you are ever relying heavily on Sacreds, if you're ever using Sacreds, in general, Sacred Units, not Mages. Mages, I could see leaning towards something like Precision, but when it comes to your Units, I mean, you, I think you need to have a really good reason to not take Major Shock Resistance. Sometimes there is a good reason to not take Major Shock Resistance, but I think those reasons are rare. It is really easy to get countered by Air Magic. If you are ever relying on your sacreds. And on, you know, on this nation, you don't need to rely on your sacreds. However, it's like, what else are you gonna take? I mean, you could take precision, though with a lot of your spells, it, like you don't you don't really have a lot of elemental evocation paths, so it, it's not enormously relevant. Uh, swiftness, it really is not very relevant to you. Well, you're gonna go up to combat speed 10 from eight. Yeah, just take major shock resistance, in my opinion, if, if you're using air magic in your bless. Uh, cold resistance, however, I think is completely wasted. Your Jotun Gigas have 15 CR, your Rim Vieties have 25 CR. If you're uh, if you're twice burning your Vedi Gigas, which I think you should, though you shouldn't necessarily transform them, I think you should twice burn them. They're going to get CR. They already have five, you know. So I think defense skill is a much stronger pick. Your Rimbaides already have kind of high defense, and this is going to improve that. Like, you don't need water walking. You're going to be in Quilled 3 a lot of the time. Rivers are going to be frozen. Already have snow move on most, if not all, of your sacred units. I just think defense skill is the most economic choice. And with Earth, I think it's really hard to justify anything that is not reinvigoration. You are a communion nation. You are a nation with good sacred mages. You might as well pick up reinvigoration for them. Now, uh, <laughs> you might be thinking about something goofy with larger. Terrible idea. Larger in general is a terrible idea. There's only like a couple of nations I think get away with it. Nations that have, say, sacred tramplers. And even then, it's a little bit challenging to tack on. And uh, Raga is something that I think can get away with larger because it's sacreds don't really incur any penalties from taking because a lot of times you're going to get attack density penalties from taking larger but when you already have like size five sacreds that doesn't matter and then you're getting all of these nice bonuses better strength better hp better map move but for this nation what you're effectively getting is less attack density and more expensive twice burning so i think it is a terrible idea there's also fire and shock resistance here it's incarnate only it might be something you want depending on what you're doing depending on what you're up against but in general, I'm going to personally prefer the reinvigoration. Uh, when it comes to astral stuff, I think if you can get away with it, spirit sight is really strong in general. For one thing, it's one of the best things you could do with your death bless. And otherwise, there is MR competing with it, which might be especially useful if you're making use of sacred thugs. Your Rim Vietes already have magic weapons. You don't really have the paths that I consider Farcaster stronger on. In fact, you're missing the specific three where I consider Farcaster to be better on. Uh, you could take Arcane 
arcane finesse, but then I think you're likely losing out on some other things that are useful to you, uh, especially if you're thinking about some like late game dwarf shenanigans. If that's if that's really your style, definitely take spirit sight. Uh, with death, I, I think it's really hard to take anything other than undead command. There's a good chance that you will be summoning undead at some point. Undead command becomes very useful when you do that. Now there is one thing for those of you who those badasses in the audience, those of you out there who need a wheelbarrow to carry your balls around in, take reforming flesh. That's a dare. I'm daring you to take reforming flesh and figure out how to put those uh, those big white mage thugs to work. That would be really cool. And there's a lot of competition for your non-incarnate nature bless. Unaging is something that can definitely help out with your Jotun Gigas. Low light vision is a potential less good alternative to spirit sight. Major and minor poison resistance are always nice. I actually messed up with this nation on a blitz not having PR, though technically I could have cast it. I was just a little lazy with my scripting. So that's, that's kind of where you're looking at PR. It's like you could also, you have mages that can kind of comfortably cast poison resistance onto your own units and your units being size, a lot of them being size one, they're kind of easy to cast big buffs on. And uh, Resilient does have a couple of points. You do have a couple of sacreds that are just barely almost into the threshold for getting into a new regeneration bracket if you're casting regeneration on them, which also applies to strong vitae. And in blood, if you're taking a blood bus, you really might as well take blood surge with this nation. But if you're a little star for points, if you want to get the three blood, strength of the flesh is fine. It's just blood surge. You do have a lot of sacred mages and blood surge is going to help out the mages to a small extent as well. It's going to help out thugs if you're using thugs. The uh, the three attack and the reinvigoration are going to be nice. So it doesn't last the entire battle, which is something to keep in mind. Uh, strength of the flesh though, if you're making use of a lot of your summonable sacreds and the uh, the rim vietes, strength of the flesh is not bad at all. And it's something that gives them value immediately and not only after they have killed something. So those are kind of my thoughts on the bless. I do think the frost father is a pretty strong pick if you're doing anything at least on the elemental side of things, if not a full rainbow. And Imprisoned Rainbow is of course nice for its path diversity. You can cast just about any spell in the game with this thing. Now, some other things to consider. Uh, the Ermin Soul can give you very, very good scales if you wanted to go for a scales build. You know, like with this build right here, you're looking at really good scales, and then if you want to, I don't know if this is, <laughs> this is the best choice of pass, but this is a very good cross path that nets you a couple of globals if you wanted to use them, and uh, gives you access to Lamia Queens very comfortably, though you could wiggle up here anyway with your Yon Gigas. Uh, this, when it comes to the Emo Nobles is not inanimate. You can twice born this. You can also transform this. I think twice born in this instance is just some insurance to protect it during transformation. It's just something you can consider. Unfortunately, it's a little bit hard to get it killed after it's twice born if you don't do something like transforming it. But it's more of just something to be reminded of is that these things are capable of twice borning and transformation, which can get you a fully slotted chassis, which not all immobile pretenders are capable of. The rest of these are not. They're all inanimate. Now that is not to say that they are not good picks. The Idol of Men has good starting paths for a Bless, so does a Monolith, and it only costs 40 for new paths. So if you did want to get in something extra, it wouldn't be enormously expensive, still kind of pricey, but not too bad. Uh, if Ill Winter and Nifoyars are heavily on your mind, you might want to consider something like the Fountain of Blood. Oof, at negative three would need a little bit of tankering. I mean, you know, I would just generally take Sloth 2 on this nation anyway. But yeah, this would be really comfortable for Blood Water rituals. And if you wanted to, I think this would be really fun. Still with very comfortable scales, you can go for a bless that heavily looks toward your ability to twice born on the cheap and potentially get some really powerful chassis out of it in the process. On top of that, like even with, without this reforming flesh bless, if you ignore it, the rest of this is pretty good for the rest of your sacreds. You've also got really good cross paths and high death for later on death rituals, which, you know, getting something like well of misery up on this nation is pretty important. I mean, so is something like Mother Oak, but Mother Oak is a little bit harder to compete for. If you can get Well of Misery up eventually, you're going to be sitting in a very good spot. And this Pretender design ensures that and also gives you some uh, some funny stuff along with it. Alright, so I've been talking about whites a lot in this video, about these Vedi Gigas having some kind of twice-born transformation gimmick, and now I'm going to demonstrate that. So I've got 20 of these little Gigas here, and I've cast 20 Twice born on all of them. The uh, the death one randoms obviously are gonna need a skull staff, but you know you don't need to make a huge pile of skull staffs. You can just pass one round between the ones that you have. Same goes for the thistle maces with what I'm about to do. And real quickly for those of you that do not know, twice born is a spell that costs 
five death gems per the size of your unit. For a size one unit, it's only going to cost five death gems. For a typical size two unit, it's going to cost the classic 10 death gems, which is what it used to cost before. For a size four unit, it'll cost 20. For a size six, it'll cost 30, which really sucks for things like Nifu Yarls now. But it's really good for things like goblins. It's really cheap to twice spawn them. What this does is that when they die, they are reincarnated where the spell was cast as a white mage, as an undead mage, with no upkeep. So it can remove the upkeep from your units, and it can also help protect their value as mages. And in some instances, improves the chassis. White mages are generally a better chassis than the mage it was before. Not always, but a lot of the time they will be better. As of the last patch, with the changes to Twice Born, what you also get are different white mage chassis depending on the size of your unit. Some of the larger chassis are very good. Now what transformation does is that it transforms the mage that casts it into some kind of monster or animal. And I have run a lot of testing with this spell. Twice Born also has, I would say, about a 20 to 25% chance from testing. It's a little hard. I think closer to 20% chance of increasing the mage that casts it, path and death magic. So there's also that. When it only costs five death gems, that's generally going to be cheaper than empowerment, by the way, if you're trying to climb death. Even when it costs only 10 death gems, it's still a decent wager. Now, transformation, I've done a decent amount of testing with this spell. This chance of failure refers to, I believe, whether or not you have a bad result, turn into a foul spawn, or die. Your mage dies when using this spell. If it succeeds, it becomes a random monster or animal, though some of the bad results, what are considered bad results, are just fine. They're monsters or animals or bugs. Uh, I find that the foul spawn results, which are feeble minded, so they lose a magic pass, though that does not matter if they are twice born because you could just get the foul spawn killed and then it comes back as a non feeble minded white mage. But I do find that that feeble mindedness with being coming a foul spawn is about the same no matter what your luck scale is. It's something around 10%. However, the chance of death I think is significantly influenced by your luck scales. At luck three, you're looking at maybe 1% deaths. At misfortune two, you're looking at something a little closer to 10%. So that's that's a significant difference. This spell actually becomes pretty scary to use at Misfortune 2, unless you're twice borning all of your mages that are using it. Because then it doesn't matter if they die. They just come back as a white mage when the transformation fails. So I'm going to transform all of these. Uh, by the way, these are something to consider with your luck scales because it is very expensive to twice born these. If you're just trying to get rid of their upkeep, transforming them is viable. However, it's much harder to protect them through twice born because it costs 20 death gems to twice spawn one of these. But yep, let's transform all 20 of these little geekjas and see what happens. All right, and I think we've had a really good spread of results here. I am at Misfortune 2 scales in this test game right now, and that has caused three of them to die during the transformation attempts. But that doesn't matter because they come back as little white hags. These are already better than the original mages that these came from. They have more than twice the amount of hit points, which means they're no longer super weak to things like Seeking Arrow. Seeking Arrow will one-shot these mages beforehand. Now they've got a lot going for them. High CR and poison resistance. They're amphibious now. They've got that chill aura, which is relevant in your cold three. Now these aren't exactly thug chassis, but they are now much better mages. So that within itself is pretty awesome. Now a couple of them have turned into foul spawn. These are feeble minded, so they have no magic paths. However, they are twice born. So there's a fix for that. Something else of note is that a lot of these have gained magic paths, even at Misfortune 2. Two scales, I find that the uh, the magic path gain isn't enormously affected. For example, this Hydra has gained a path in nature. This Griffin has gained a path in air, which is very good, especially considering its size, which is going to become relevant in a minute. This Salamander has gained a path in fire, kind of like air is something that you don't naturally have. This Ice Drake has gained a path in water. It's now water three kind of high. This Dire Wolf has gained a path in death, and that's it. Now let's get them killed. I'm also going to get this uh, this Gija killed to show you what it twice borns as. Uh, don't need these, they're already twice born. Funnily enough, these things might be able to just take the province attacking it all at once. Though well, some will certainly die, but there are some uh, there are some pretty strong units in this in this uh, in this group right here. Some transformation results are just good, and you don't necessarily want to turn them into white mages. Though these ones aren't particularly nice. All right, so let's see. Most of them died. A couple of them did not. Just real quickly, let's send the remaining units to their death. And now let's take a look at what we've got. So this is what you get when a size two or a size three. 
commander gets twice born is just a standard white mage. Uh, this one is it is a little bit better than the white hag. So not a terrible result by any means. Not desirable compared to some of the others, but not too bad. There's also, if you have like, say like a size two or three flyer, which you can get through transformation, you'll get something that looks a little bit kind of like a undead Shabalbin that unfortunately can't fly. Now let's look at what you get with a size four result. Suddenly you're looking at something really beefy. Like this right here, look at these stats. Look at this MR, uh, decent natural protection, high morale, really high hit points. This is a thug chassis. These paths are not bad for thugging. It's still got that chill aura in your cold dominion. This thing is cool. Now you would of course have to suit it up to use it that way, but either way, still a very resilient mage. Uh, I didn't get any that could enter communions in this run, but these things would make really resilient communion slaves. And then we've got the big boys. This is what size five and size six chassis become. And this is why the transformation gimmick is really interesting. It's only costing 13 gems to turn your Vedi Gijas into this. This thing is a monster, 130 hit points. It has fear, it comes with fear. Base fear five and then increased by its death paths. Decently high MR, really high morale, forms craters into the ground wherever it hits with its staff. Uh, decently fine base natural protection. Zero encumbrance, really cool. Something you, uh, you, you would need to armor these up though if you're planning on using them as thugs. This kind of thing right here, like look at this path I got through transformation. I'd be obnoxious to deal with. This is why reforming flesh is kind of an interesting choice on this nation. Now something else that I've gotten through twice burning are more death paths. Uh, this thing that was a salamander before picked up a path in death when it twice born. Uh, one of these, I can't remember which one was the doggo that already got a path in death through transformation, but one of them also picked up a death path when it twice born. Uh, this one, which is death two initially hit death three when twice borning. So not only are you getting better chassis through doing this, but you are also getting new paths in magic, higher paths in magic. It is a really interesting thing that, you know, any, any nation that has mages that are death and nature could technically do. This one is just so interesting because twice born is so cheap on these. Oh, whoops, not you. Ugh. On these is incredibly cheap. And also this is a, uh, a special twice born chassis for the young gigas. It's mostly just a visual thing. They're not that special as far as whites go, though they do maintain their fortune teller abilities. Like honestly, I'd probably rather have this chassis for the uh, the superior stats. Now, is this worth it? Is this strong? That I don't know. I, I need to actually like put this thing to the test and do some tinkering around with it. It is fairly gem intensive and nature and death gems are really important to you. Uh, Mother Oak is something that you'd really want to strongly consider getting a hold of if you're using a lot of transformation. It is something you technically can get a hold of with your Yotun Gijas. If you have construction six, all you need is an N2 Astro 1 random like this one and an N3 random, which isn't entirely reliable to get, but you can get a hold of them. Make a Moonvine bracelet and a Thistle Mace and you're at N5, but that's not fast. So there's competition for the Mother Oak and there often is, It's you're gonna struggle getting it first. Though you could always cast over it if you're that kind of dirty bastard. So this is something that I think time will tell whether or not this is a viable strategy. Even if it's not super strong, I think this is really, really cool. Like, I just mean, look at this thing. It can bless itself. Crazy cool paths for thugging. Full slots uh, with my current build holds a reforming flesh bless. Pretty funny. Like this is just neat. And definitely my favorite part of the nation is the easy ability to do this with the size one mages that always have death and nature. So I'm definitely interested to hear your thoughts on this. If you have any, share it in the comment section. I would love to see what you think. Here is uh, something that's going on after you cast Ill Winter. You'll get random attacks on provinces with cold dominion which oh it's got a magic path i'm like what the hell is that thing spitting gold oh, spitting slime disgusting look at that Ugh. It's actually really cool. Slime spitting doggo. Here's a, a Nefal giant attacking a province. This could actually be pretty annoying to uh, small amounts of PD. Like this is obviously prepared province, but if someone's got like a, you know, a six PD province, that could be a problem. Here we go. That's what I'm talking about. A uh, big old group of Nefal giants. This could be annoying as hell. And this is why you're not going to uh, make any friends casting Ill Winter, among other reasons, you know, it significantly hampers income, more needful giant attacks. Sometimes it's a uh, skin shifter and some wolves, which isn't too scary. 
as you can see. And here is a, a, a Nifo Jarl um, cast with Winter's Call. You do need Ill Winter up to get this. Unfortunately, it does have upkeep, which I think sucks. Hopefully it's something that uh, will get patched up in the future. I don't think these should have upkeep when they're summons. But still, in a Cold 3, which is common after Ill Winter's been cast, these things are really powerful. Ice Protection 3, Cold Power 1, Chill Aura 19. And Cold Dominion with Full Gear, these are super competent. Ugh, another water random. Gross. Oh, here's a another pretty cool example of random attacks in Ill Winter. A Nifal Shaman, which has some magic paths, as well as a bunch of Winter Wolves, which are actually fairly decent units. Let's see what they managed to do to this uh, <laughs> these independents. Damn, look at that cold aura on those wolves. So this is what I really like to see on the Nifal Yarls, the air randoms. These things can be a huge pain in the ass. With a gem, they can cast Mist Form on themselves. Uh, they can cast Flight on themselves, which can really screw with a lot of people's scripts. Though in general, you're probably going to be looking at spells more along the lines of Soul Vortex. This is going to reinvigorate and heal them at the expense of whatever's around them. So really good spell for SCs and thugs. Uh, and Vulnerability might be relevant depending on what you're fighting. But if you have sufficient protection, you will skip this one. Hopefully you're not using a, you don't need Stygian Skin. If you need Stygian Skin, consider getting some equipment. Uh, liquid Body is pretty good. It does make them a little bit slower and not hit as hard, but it helps protect them from afflictions and gives them resistance to mundane damage. So pretty good uh, if <laughs> you're raiding underwater with them and you know, Ice Shield is something to consider. Uh, be careful with Quicken Self. A lot of times when you're setting up SCs, you want to focus on more defensive spells rather than offensive ones. Of course, Quickness can be defense through offense, but you do want to worry about them fatiguing out. Those things like Soul Vortex can, of course, help with that. Uh, Breath of Winter is something to also consider in the Enchantment Tree, which is going to boost its Cold Aura. And of course, in the Air Path and the Air Randoms, you do have things like Flight. And in Alteration, Mirror Image, Mist Form, and maybe in some weird instances air shield. So pretty cool to have access to these, especially in the late ages. Just be careful with them. Try to keep them out of hot provinces and hopefully in the future we're not going to have upkeep on them because that I, I just think it really sucks. At the same time, you know, they're, they're worth the upkeep. So when selecting your initial profit as Vaidiheim, you do have a couple of options right from the get-go. You could, of course, profitize your Vaidiharl. He is your best leader. He will do the job. He will help with your expansion army. You could also, however, consider profit advertising your Dimbaeti. If you want him to, he still can go with your expansion army and act as a force multiplier for it with its H3 damage spells, but then you will have an H3 assassin. That can be really nice, really useful, and really annoying to your opponents depending on how you use it. Now, I'm just going to use it as a normal assassin and profitize my commander, but it is completely a viable thing to profitize. Usually with my initial expansion, uh, I do think you should be recruiting assassins for the first few turns for sure to help with expansion. I like a few rim Vietes and a Berserker to throw in with my initial expansion army, but then I usually switch over to Wolf Brothers. Uh, but you can expand with Rim Vietes and Berserkers for the entire expansion phase. They work. They do a really good job. I just like the Wolf Brothers for because they are also very good and they move far. All right, so let's see what I'm surrounded by. Uh, you might recognize this map as well. <laughs> LARPing as, uh, as Hinam right now. Uh, this is the script that I like for my starting army. My Prophet way up front with Divine Blessing and H3 damage spell spam. My melee units on attack closest and archers on fire closest. Tends to do the job. And um, There's a couple of things you want to think about when you're looking for targets for expansion. Uh, for one thing, forests, very high priority. Because of the recruitment you get from them, you recruit uh, the Vedi Hearses out of them. And these are really important commanders to be getting early on. Because not only do they lead your expansion armies, but they can attack provinces that you have assassins on without having to use assassins to do so. It's a little bit more efficient. In general, you're going to want to be looking for weaker provinces though, because the starting army is going to take some attrition. In general, you will get like two, maybe three provinces out of it uh, if you're not so unfortunate that you can only get one. It kind of depends on your starting surroundings. But definitely prioritize a forest if you have one in your cap circle. And here is that expansion army in action against just some standard independence. Not a whole lot of heavy infantry, which is fortunate. 
but yeah, you can see just they do an incredible amount of damage. Once again, to melee range with their six attacks per square. Only lost two of the Vedi archers. It is pretty good. Those are the most disposable units. And now I can recruit Vedi Hearses from this province. Also, I can get Wolf Riders. Oh, just need one more recruitment point. I'll get my uh, order scales in here soon. And these are also very good for expansion and a very good reason to look for forests right away. Not as good as the Wolf Brothers, but they're in addition to the Wolf Brothers. And this is nice. Uh, not too bad of a province right past it. Very fortunate. Oh, this one actually doesn't look too bad. Oh, so it actually ended up being a, uh, a decent amount more than I expected here at the expense of my Vayeti Yarl, which is really unfortunate. I actually very rarely uh, lose that thing in expansion armies. It, it almost never. Usually I, I lose the expansion army if that happens. However, I actually managed to, by the grace of this heavy infantry blocking this Rim Vayeti, take this province, as I did manage to route the Indies. So pretty bad performance on my part, I will admit, but I did at least get away with the province. And this is a completely viable expansion army. Honestly, it's actually kind of big. For Wolf Brothers, you could easily get away with, depending on what you're fighting 15 to 20, but this one will last a good long while and be able to take on a lot of different things, including barbarians and heavy cavalry due to their high defense skill. And here are the Wolf Brothers in action. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of javelinists. Uh, as you can see, when one dies, it's the rider that dies and the wolf remains. However, unfortunately, you do not get to keep the wolf at the end of the battle if the wolf survives, but still nice, makes the units more effective. I did take more losses than I would expect from a province like this, it's kind of unusual, but that's uh, that's why you bring along some extra. And here's a good example of why it's nice to have uh, a lot of these Vedi Hearses running around, is I can now take this without having to use one of my assassins to do so, I can move my assassin on to work on another province. When you can afford it, definitely consider recruiting wolf riders, in your forest provinces. They are very good at expansion. Here are some wolf riders against uh, heavy cavalry. Not an enormous amount, but still goes to show that their defense skill can definitely help them cut down on attrition, including against heavy infantry, which also isn't nothing to shrug off. Here are some wolf brothers against tribe. <laughs> Pretty effective against at least Lion Tribe. Uh, I'd like to try to find some Wolf Tribe to pitch him up against. Here is up against a Jade Maiden province. And with their high defense skill, they managed to take on the Jade Maidens pretty effectively. Uh, attack Rear Command with some Wolf Riders, helping out a little bit, and minimal losses. Ah, oh, dang, there's still one, uh, one commander left. And here are Wolf Riders against, or Wolf Brothers rather, against a Crystal Sorceress province. Once again, high defense skill helping out with the lance strikes, though it did kill a couple goblins. And four losses on that prophet. <laughs> it looks like it was actually the uh, priestesses, probably astral randoms doing some damage. So it's turn 12, uh, 18 provinces. I've definitely done better before in testing with Vaidiheim, but I kind of goofed with my, I mean, I, I got two provinces with it. That's fine with my initial expansion party, but I was down a uh, prophet, which does hurt when expanding. Almost got 19. One of my assassins got killed by that mountain commander. Uh, got plenty of gold at the end here. I haven't started any infrastructure yet, just been a little lazy with it. A lot of Yon Gigjas, maybe a little too much. Might be a little bit better to uh, put gold toward infrastructure. And actually a decent number of assassins left over, which is relevant in your first war. So all around, pretty reliable nation when it comes to expansion. Even without a heavy bless, definitely do not need an awake expander. See if I can find some other stuff to uh, demonstrate expansion on. Can't find any um any horse tribe be a good demonstration uh they do just fine the wolf brothers at least do just fine against horse tribe oh also nice with this star is like turn 13 and now i have this pretty handy but yeah up against a uh, horse tribe cavalry is an example of what uh using Vedi Zerkers and Rimvayetis isn't quite as good against, but the Wolf Brothers are just fine. Same with the uh, Zerkers are a little risky. You do want that high defense skill that the Wolf Brothers have. Oh, well that's interesting. Got kind of a large mass here. I might as well throw them into it. So here's a pretty good demonstration against Barbarians. There's almost 60 Barbarians here against less than 30 of the Wolf Brothers and Wolf Riders. There's actually a significant portion of these are Wolf Riders, so they are the inferior units. And their high defense skill makes them very effective against Barbarian. Or, oh, I guess slightly over 30 on the Wolf Brothers. But yeah, minimal losses against this amount of Barbarians. Pretty good. And oh man, they just, uh, they just tore through these Woodsman blowpipes. Though, uh... To be fair, this is kind of a, a large-ish party right here. There's like 45 of them. This could easily be split up into two expansion parties. In fact, I think I will do exactly that. Or I don't even need to move them. I could just, boom, recruit. Here they are against some Lizards, which, eh, not a lot of Lizards, but they do have an equal 
uh, number of attacks per square, and a demonstration against some heavy cavalry, which as long as there aren't too many heavy cavalry, they are pretty effective against. Here is an example of too many heavy cavalry, though just barely. Um, the crossbowmen definitely aren't helping, but this was actually a very, very close fight. Look at this. Come on, you almost got it. Oh, and there's the route. Look at the same time that the independence routed. So pretty close, would be easy to mop up. Still a good demonstration of the power of the Wolf Brothers. Like a lot of nations with 25 units and even their profit would get smeared by this. And as promised, I'm going to quickly demonstrate a uh, Turbo Communion using Lamia Queens. I've got two Lamia Queens to act as Sabbath slaves. Well, I guess technically that one's a Sabbath slave and this one is a Communion. So I just built a slave matrix for it. Just for shits, cause I could with my pretender. But empowering wouldn't be too difficult if you end up with a Lamia queen that doesn't have blood. Pretty easy nation to empower with. And these will be supporting 14 Jotungijas in a communion. And I just have, you know, these are just the units I had lying around. And I just slapped together a uh, goofy little Marignon army. Some flaming arrows, some fireballs, and magma bolts, a couple of H3 priests, things like that. And let's peek in on how these Lamia queens do in these communions. Just got darkness up because the whole idea of this army is a horde of skeletons. So the Soul Vortex comes online, killed a uh, killed a blood slave right there that was chilling out in it. And what Soul Vortex is going to do, it's going to replenish HP and reinvigorate this Lamia Queen at the expense of the Lamias that she has on Guard Commander. Uh, all of these things regenerate at really high amounts, as you'll see, look, 7 HP right there. That one uh, <laughs> took a big damage hit, turned into a snake, but look, boom, right back, 11 HP. And these things are very hardy. This will last a very long time, if not indefinitely. And look at this, look at what these Gijas are doing. They are spamming the shit out of skeletons. What's going on over here isn't that important. I guess you could look at it for a bit just because it's fun. Whee! Now, Turbo Communions aren't really my forte, not really my play style. So I don't know if I'm doing anything goofy here. All I do know is that this is working. These Lamia Queens are supporting these Geekjas very well and enabling them to just sit down and shoot out. Some are casting Swarm because I, you know, had some nature gems on them. I didn't script this too carefully. And <laughs> imps. They're holding blood slaves and stuff. Yeah, just watch the skeletons come. Boom, 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 does not end. Uh, let's see how the Lamy is doing, 196 fatigue. Also 196 fatigue. Uh, they don't care. The Lamias on guard commander don't care. They just regenerate back any HP that she sucks up from them. And the skeletons do not stop until, well, the battle stops. So this isn't something I'd consider a good trade. I mean, this is just a demonstration battle. The thing of note here is that the Lamia Queens are still around at the end of the battle. The Lamias are still around at the end of the battle. These things make very, very hardy Sabbath slaves for this nation, for your young Gijas. They are a perfect fit in that regard. So this video went on a, a little bit longer than I was hoping that it would. So I didn't have time to go into research priorities. I'll, uh, I'll leave a comment down below with some of my opinions on good research priorities for this nation, just good spells you should pay attention to. And if you're uh, if you're unfamiliar with this channel and just kind of checking out this video because of the new nation and everything, uh, I do a lot of multiplayer videos where I cast multiplayer games, uh, Dominions 5, from all of the players' perspectives in the entire game. So check them out if that seems like something you'd be interested in. It's been hard to find uh, time for videos that aren't part of the multiplayer series lately, but Hopefully I'll be able to get more of these types of videos out in the future here. Huh?